We've got a lot of great questions here. I think we're going to keep rolling. And what may end up happening is somewhere in the middle of that, it gets broken into a, a two-part problem, two-part video. There's no problems here. <laughs> What is your opinion on dew claw removal and tail docking, specifically in GSPs and Vsless? So, I mean, tails are going to be breed standard, right? So that's going to be something that uh, just matches what they look. Um, I've, I've been around some short hairs that didn't have, and I think the, probably the biggest, one of the biggest reasons is you get a lot of, because they have that long tail, you get a yeah. lot of tail trauma at the end. And so then you end up doing that docking when that dog's, you know, considerably older. It's a lot harder. Yeah, and once I get a wound on the tip of the tail, they're incredibly frustrating to heal. Um, yeah. And so I think that's going to be a big reason um, that that was probably ever you know established in that in the breed. And smacking like the corners of walls, and they come around as soon as that starts bleeding. Like you said, it just dies. it's everything. It never quits so, bleeding unless your dog's depressed all the time, and then something else is wrong. So. Well, and I've seen all of these things where they come up with like uh, plastic tubes to put over them so they can try and heal. All it is, and then. As soon as that heals again, they smack it on something else and it opens up a new one. So, so and then dew claws, um, I mean, again, that's gonna be breeder preference. Um, you know, I think if they're adult dogs. I, what about the studies I've seen more recently that show that there is actual a usage of the dew claw? Have you seen any of those? Or? Seen studies, no. Okay, I will send them to you so that we can look into it more because I've started seeing people are saying that there's actually usage and how that works, but I don't buy into it yet. There's very few articles. So I think it's because the dogs go. The birds are here. <laughs> No, <laughs> <laughs> I don't know. I don't know. Yeah. So, but yeah, routinely, like I would not in a, I mean, I'd do them, but in a four or five month old dog, I probably not take their dew claws off at that point. But when they're puppies, um, this is outside of that research. There may be some, some good validity to that, but yeah. outside of that, I would, I would say. Well, it's, it's new to me. I've just seen it in the last like six months, maybe at the most that people have started talking about it. And I don't know if it's currently we're still taking dew claws. Yeah. Great question, that's a really good one. Next one here is Lovell Robert. Robert. What should you look for in a vet? Is using a clinic for a routine stuff in an animal hospital for emergency stuff acceptable? Or should I take all of my business to an animal hospital for continuity of care? So I think that's really gonna depend on where you're at. I, I think, you know, I'm a little different in my county. I'm the only veterinary practice. You know, we're a three doctor practice. Yeah. We're the only practice in the county. So um, we do emergency. Um, as you get into bigger areas where they don't do emergency, um, you're, you're not really going to have a choice. I, I think um, you need to find a good general practitioner that you trust. Um, trust that is you're key. happy with them. Um, figure out what their system for emergency is. Some places in big cities still do emergencies, you know, sometimes up to certain times of night and hmm. are available for questions. Just kind of depends. There's a lot of different systems and it's going to be veterinary dependent. But I think the big thing is going to find a veterinarian that you trust, you like. Yep. Um, obviously, you can't find one in every city that hunts with bird dogs. And that would be everyone's dream, right? Yeah. Uh, that we yeah. understand the breed and, and then what's going on. But uh, I, I think that's a, for, for me is, uh, you know, if I was helping someone find a veterinarian, it's just find somebody that's got good common sense and, um, you know, has your pet best interest. I think that that's a big thing that you mentioned. If you can find somebody that has experience with supporting breeds, because that's most of what we're working with here, it changes a lot because um, this touches a little bit on the last question, but every time with ad, a few questions back about advocating for your dog if you think they're sick. The average, on average, we take our dogs into the vet and they've been really sick when we've had those issues in the past. Vets are like, there's nothing wrong with them because they seem, they're mellowed out to the point where they seem, you know, maybe more like the average lethargic, overweight dog that probably comes to the clinic. So, but somebody that know, truly knows the sporting breeds, they can say, yeah, you're, I mean, this doesn't look like a typical short hair. It's super well behaved for a one-year-old puppy or whatever. So, somebody that knows sporting breeds is a is a good point. Yeah, for sure. Awesome, awesome, great question. Next, here we have from BDE Willow. Hi, my bed is recommending I spay my pup at six months. So we had a lot of questions about spaying and neutering, and this is going to be one of them. I, I don't think we're going to get everybody mentioned in here. Um, this is another, right below it. There's another question about neutering and GSP. So let's go ahead and talk about the benefits and drawbacks of spaying and neutering and when you think it truly should happen and why. Okay, so traditional veterinary answer, right? Spay your dog in six months. That mm -hmm. is the traditional long-standing answer that we've always had in veterinary medicine. Why? So probably the biggest reason was, and I, I would have to actually continue to go look this up and I did, but there was an article a long time ago that talked about um, 
the increases of mammary cancer and then what that percentage increased, excuse me, decreased over time. Each cycle, the dog's chance for mammary cancer increases. Correct. Correct. And what the, then it's like, I, I, I remember reading this at one yeah, point in time, so like specific percentages. Their, so after their first heat cycle, it was maybe 97, and the next one, maybe 95, the yep. next 92, best way to put that. Um, and so what happened, you know, so that was a big way, this is, um, increases chances of, of mammary cancer. Um, that plus or minus, because I've had lots of dogs that were spayed um, under six months that had mammary yeah. cancer. Um, I think there's probably some validity to it, and you know, under the influence of estrogen, those things are more likely to happen. Sure, just um, like having testicles and testicular cancer. You can't have testicular cancer without testicles. Correct, correct. So. Um, and so that was always the standard answer. So veterinary medicine has gone with that. And that's, I think, in, you know, if I'm talking about spaying a chihuahua tomorrow, yeah. that's my same answer for six months. Yeah. Um, Small breed versus large breed, though, too. Correct. Okay. And so, um, and, and we'll talk about females for a second on this. Um, but then once we've gotten past a couple of heat cycles, and we'll talk about the benefits of that. I usually want to spay a female because as we, as those females get older and they start to not clean out as well after a heat cycle, we definitely increase our risk of pyometria. And so pyometria is going to be an infected yeah. uterus. Um, and those dogs typically come in vomiting their guts out, they're lethargic and their uterus goes from something that's this size to something that's bigger and round than this beer can. Okay. And so that's something that um, definitely, there's probably not a female dog that I think that gets past five if she's not in a breeding system needs to still have her uterus. Um, but the benefits of keeping that is there's, and, and I see this, feel this in practice, and there's some pretty good research that shows that we're decreasing, we're by spaying earlier, we're increasing the risk of sports injuries, um, predominantly ACL tears um, in dogs. And so, which makes sense, right? Those hormones are responsible for bone development. And so if we're um, bone and ligament development, if we're, we're removing those sources of hormones, the ovaries yeah. of the testicles, um, then we're going to increase those risks of, um, of those injuries. Um, so I think that's been something. One of the more common ones that I think you mentioned this to me was like CCL tears or the dog's ACL For sure. equivalent. Yeah, that's probably the biggest one. Um, and this is my subjective view, right, is that we treat a lot of ACL tears. I mean, a lot in veterinary medicine. Yeah. And that is, it is always on the rise as far as the number of times that we do that. I got to meet an orthopedic surgeon today, yeah. um, Dr. Kayla, I'll check on his last name, um, works out of Houston area. And he said that he does, he averages like six TPLO surgeries a day when yeah. he's doing surgery. And it's insane. And I would just know without a fact, 40 years ago, there was not that same number of cruciate injuries. Um, and so I think, I think early spay fever has helped with that. I'm no researcher, but that would be, yeah. that would be my guess. That Do you think it could have been less diagnosed or? No, they're pretty easy to diagnose. They're, yeah. they're carrying their leg. <laughs> <laughs> right? I mean, that, and they'll... It's injured. <laughs> yeah. We can tell. He's walking like a three-legged dog. So, um, I think that's definitely a big thing. Spe speaking of that, like, when I worked at... Uh, guided at a place, there was a dog that holds his leg, he probably tore it. Probably did, and then they, they will actually, the muscles over time will compensate. And, and, and they can kind of get back to it. <laughs> but they'll never be 100%. They probably won't be. The other thing that I was talking, this is getting completely tangent and now a little bit, but when I was talking to him about this, um, the CCL tear, because it's it's, tech, it's technically a CCL. CCL yeah, same thing. It's the same thing. Okay. Yeah. So ACL, CCL, same thing. Um, typically the dogs are referred to as a CCL, is that correct? Or, and then commonly referred to an ACL so that we can understand as layman's folk. Yeah. Um, but they were talking about I said, how can you tell that it's a wear injury versus actual trauma? Because most of the time with humans, you step, slip wrong, move wrong, something tear your sale. I did that playing football. Um, but with dogs, it's usually a wear issue from some type of you know, a confirmation issue or, or something that effect combined with how active they are. But he said that they actually do pathology on the ligaments and they can say that this is repeated trauma and overuse or the ligament looks perfectly in great condition and just snapped or something, yeah. which doesn't happen very often. It's, it's, it's usually an overuse over time thing. Interesting. Um, so then the other part of that spay neuter deal, there's there's one research article that came out of California, uh, UC Davis, that talked about uh, increased uh, mammary or increased cancer in uh, golden retrievers. Okay. Were spayed. Uh, and so 
it's, there was a question about cancer, that's going to be some of that decision on the other side of that. Um, Interesting. So there are studies that show both directions, mm -hmm. which mm -hmm. is contradicting. Yeah, for sure. Frustrating. Um, so male dogs, um, my opinion on male dogs, I mean, I have two male dogs in the house. That never so let's say problem. spaying general, like a, as a general rule, spaying later for larger breed dogs, like what most of the sporting breeds yeah. are, is going to be healthier for a development growth and development standpoint. So a female dog that three to five years is going to be my typical rip. Two to five. Once they've had one or two heat cycles, so that two to five yep. is when, you know, five being kind of the max there on those female dogs. Okay, so now we're moving on to neutering. I probably don't have a great reason to neuter a dog unless we start to have health problems later on or behavior problems. Okay. Um, so we all know we can live with males that are intact in the house well. I yeah. Do every day. Everybody's always worried about them peeing on all everything. Well, it's those are all learned behaviors. If your dog understands this is the house. We don't pee in the house. They're not going to lift their leg and pee on things. Correct. If they do, it's a behavioral issue mm -hmm. that even that more or less won't even be fixed at that point in time, depending on how conditioned it is Correct. by neutering. So, eh. so that would be a big reason. Um, dogs getting out to roam. So if you've got a short hair that can clear fences, or yeah. some, some of the kind of working dog that can clear fences, and they're getting out and roaming the neighborhood, smelling the nasty. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, that's a that's a problem. Um, <laughs> If you've got, uh, so that's obviously detrimental to their health when they get run over. So that, yeah, that, that would be, be a bad health benefit, health, uh, benefit if your dog doesn't get run over. So but, what about with older dogs? What what are the... So there are some chances of cancer, right? Again, yep. you can't get testicular cancer if you don't have testicles. But, um, and there's some also some, you know, around the rectum, there's some areas there that can get some um, testosterone-based tumors. Interesting. Um, so I, I think, you know, reasonably, um, Seven, eight, nine, I think is fine to neuter those dogs. But again, I think they're fine if they keep them. Yep. Um, it's always interesting to have clients that come in and are seem to be, there's a, an attachment to their male dogs being intact yeah. like it's themselves. Yeah. Um, this is always male clients who are attached to their male dogs. Oh, testing. He's going to hate me because yeah. I got him neutered. Well, it feels like they're stealing their oh, their manhood, you know, and they would never <laughs> want that to happen. So yeah. yeah. It's a weird attachment. But, um, I don't think, you know, neutering a male dog at a year old is, is not necessary unless you're just going to have some major behavior issues or something like that. You know, and if you're living in a house with a male dog and a female dog and both are intact, you just, you know. You're going to have problems at some point. You're going to have problems. You better have some kind of plan to go board the male dog somewhere, board the female dog somewhere. One or the other. Yeah, because we, I mean, I even heard stories about dogs digging through walls to get to the female while they're in heat or whatever, just yeah. insanity. So, I mean, I think that's always something you've got to consider. Like what is the, the you know, if, I, if I've got a really prized female that I want to breed and I've got some male dog that I don't want to ever stud out, mm -hmm. then maybe sure, you know, but I don't think health wise neutering that male dog at two years old is any different than leaving him intact. What about prostate issues? Can be there for sure. Um, and then, so we'll turn around right into the, if that happens, then we just turn around and neuter those dogs, and those typically go away because those are typically um, testosterone, testosterone driven. Yeah, testosterone driven. Gotcha. So, uh, again, unless there's health issues, probably not 100% necessary, but at the same time, that neuter dog can potentially be easier to live with. Now, the one thing that I want to throw out here that we hear the most often is spaying and neutering made my dog fat and lazy. What do you have to say about that? Well, I'm getting fat and I'm not neutered, so. <laughs> <laughs> um, <laughs> um, so typically, I think what happens is dogs' metabolism change. Yeah, um, and no, no doubt that happens. Um, and it changes even more with the spay and neuter. Like correct. as dogs get That's older, yeah. metabolism so changes. Are, they're changing. I think sometimes those coincide. Um, you know, reasons dogs can be overweight, right? Is I mean, there's definitely some health reasons, thyroid reasons, things like that, where dogs can be overweight. Yeah, they're, they're worth looking into. So just blowing off yeah. and saying my dog's fat will five-year-old middle-aged dog can have thyroid hypothyroid issues low thyroid issues and if that's the case then we need to supplement that appropriately um, and that can definitely help with some of the appetite absolutely increases. so it's not always just kicked under the table but you know reducing some of that feed sometimes or switching sometimes to a diet feed that's yeah. more fiber based um, that's going to give them that, that way they can feel. yeah they can eat enough and kibble you know, like, i gave my 60 pound dog a quarter of a cup of dog food. Well, and I was, day, you, know. you know, so we've got um, the old man, Rex. Everybody knows him, Grandpa Rex. Uh, he is an easy keeper, and the older he gets, and tabs him slows down. I said, well, we just keep him on a slightly lower amount, and he does fine. We regulate that great, and he stays 
And I was actually talking to the food guys about this and they said, you don't want to go below the recommended cups for your dog's weight. So um, we're big advocates for feeding to condition, but that was expressed that on the high end of that is more important, uh, is, is less important basically. You can't get in as much trouble overfeeding, but you can actually be um, holding back what your dog is getting and needs from a nutrition standpoint, like vitamins, minerals, everything else, if you're feeding below the recommended cups for their body weight. And that's the case when you need to switch to a different formula like what you're talking about. And that, yeah, either different formula. Because I never even thought about that. I was like, well, he looks great. And we just, because we had to cut back food a little bit, but he could be actually lacking in the vitamins and minerals he needs out of that diet because he's not eating enough kibble. And so maybe not just eating like a diet food, but switching to a lower fat, lower calorie yeah. food um, altogether, different lifestyle dog food. Um, you know, we typically always feed a performance type food in this dog that we're hunting yeah. around but, um, or, or working year round. But, you know, for a dog that hunts 15 times a year, I think, you know, normal lifestyle dog foods pretty well. And just, you know, adding at increased feed on his hunting trips and, and leading okay. up to that and conditioning the dogs, it's gonna be a big thing. So we got a ton of questions about spaying and neutering. We spent a lot of time on that, but um, ultimately it is in the opinion here, um, gonna be a little bit better to wait a little longer than that six month mark. And then at the same time, if you aren't breeding, it doesn't, all, it doesn't hurt to be spaying and neutering sometime after maturity. Yeah, and I guess the emails I just touched on that again, I, I don't think that, you know, that two years, maybe even a little bit younger than that, I mean, having a, 60 pound female dog in the house or even a 40 pound female dog in the house that's going through a heat cycle is not fun. So at least getting that first heat cycle, yeah. I think is super important. Um, so we know that dog's gonna be closer to a year, uh, year old when that second one comes and just getting the, uh, the joints in better condition. Perfect. Thanks for the questions, guys. Now we're on to Facebook questions. We only had, uh, we had a few last Facebook questions, but we've got some good ones. Um, this one was spaying and neutering. So. Um, Drew Clements, we're going to mention you just because we've got the question here. And then I would like to know about this as well, Ryan Butler. We answered lots of things on spaying and neutering. So see the last five minutes before this. Yeah, and he asked, does it change with a bigger dog? I think it doesn't. For a sporting dog, it does not change. Perfect. So sporting breeds in general. For sure. But you get into, um, I don't want to use the term foo-foo, but I'm going to say foo-foo dogs. We'll use a Yorkie. Purse dogs. Purse dogs. Yeah, if it'll fit in your purse. Different rules apply for sure. Okay. Next here we have uh, Chris Edwards on Facebook. It says, I noticed that you don't run a vest on the dogs. This is a little bit long, but the whole thing is the question. I have uh, for the last couple of years with my boys, but this year I had an incident with foxtail grass seeds getting stuck under the vest and embedding in their skin. First, I'd like to know what you feel about vests holding more seeds. Second of all, causing them to burrow in and why that you don't use them. Second, if this happens, again, is there any advice you can give us to deal with the grass on infection or what should we be looking for to prevent this? Okay, so so I think a big part of this, and I know it's your yeah. video from our hunt in Montana this year on the tailgate check. Yeah. I think that's gonna be a big part of this, vest or not vest. Yep. I think it is making sure when you get that dog back to the truck, just check everybody over, get those out of the coat, maybe in your in your pack, mm -hmm. uh, in the truck, just have a small comb or something, you can get those out. Where should we be looking? Armpits, okay. sure, between the toes. Between the toes are a big, big one. Big, big places. Yep. Um, and then make sure flipping that foot over and looking in between the pads. Mm -hmm. um, those are gonna be the big places. Um, inside the ears, um, those are places that we can get those. Yeah, so uh, Vex actually got a couple this year. You pulled one of them out. Yeah, so yep. that's something just to think that tailgate check, and if you hadn't seen that video, check that one out because that's a good one. Just kind of going over the basics of everything we're looking for. Absolutely. So um, the next item of you haven't seen us wear vests. Um, I put vests on the dogs depending on the cover and situation that we're at. Um, I would say maybe I got a little bit lazy this year, but it's it all depends on cover. So if we're going to be hunting a lot of rough cover, I always put them on them. And that would be if we hunted some of the things in South Dakota where we've been hunting a lot is gonna be milo fields. That milo leaves, grain, stock, all of that stuff cuts them up pretty bad around their eyes, muzzle, chest, all of it. We hunted a lot of grass this year and shelter belts and those shelter belts are pretty open. So there's not a whole lot of stuff that they're running through, which is why I wasn't running vests on them. The other side of it is when we start hunting in the snow, 
unless there's a real hard ice crust on there that they're kind of breaking and beating through, um, the snow doesn't affect them either. There was one day that uh, Nick seemed to be a little redder than normal and I ended up throwing a vest on him and if you watch all of our videos, you'll see him wearing a vest. But the that, that side of it is, so sometimes we do, sometimes we don't. I use um, Lion Country Supplies Bird Dog Armor Vest and I run that loose. So a lot of vests, I think people cinch them up tight so they stay tight. I run mine on the size that kind of fits their body and then I run those straps about as loose as possible and I've found that that little bit of bagging prevents anywhere in their armpits, anywhere around their neck, chest, um, and then you don't have a tight fit that stuff's getting collected in. The on of different types of seeds are gonna be more dangerous than others and if you're in areas where they're at, things like cheatgrass, foxtail that I believe was mentioned in here is another one. Um, we had some issues with Indian grass and Indian grass doesn't historically have a bad on or isn't known for having a bad on, but there's so many seeds if they run through a wall of that Indian grass that it's just like they're floating through the air and they get inhaled. Um, what other spear grass is one that's more down in this area? Spear grass down here. Okay. Uh, if you go to, um, I think it's meanseeds.org, that might be, I'll, I'll try and throw it in somewhere here. Um, MainSeeds.org would be one that you can look at that talks more about your local areas and, and things to look for. But like you said, checking your dog over is going to help prevent that. The next we actually mentioned in an earlier, but if your dog is acting different, take them to the vet. Um, check your temperature of the dog. Uh, the normal temperature of a dog is 10... Up to 102.5. Starting low end would be 100.3? Yeah, 100.5, 100 somewhere there. 100.5 to 102.5 average. And I would say that our short hairs, if we're on the, the top end of that, you know, like people have low grade temps, that's where it starts. That If I've got a dog that's in the 102.5 range, even at the vet clinic, I have them say, oh, it's normal. Well, not for my dog. And if you just check your dog's temperature and know on a regular basis, they run around 100.5. If they're up two degrees, unless they just had gone running or something, yeah. that's going to be... Um, something to pay attention to. So, Robert Lovewell says, do you recommend wet feeding, i.e. adding water to dry kibble? Um, you may have seen this in some of our videos. I do it while we're on the road to force hydration. It, uh, I feed wet every day, so it's kind of- You feed wet every day. So, it can be done either way. Um, we for sure do it while we're on the road to force hydration so that they're drinking enough to kind of um, help with that recovery, but um, another thing that a lot of people say is my dog eats like a wild animal, adding water to that can help slow them out so that they're not swallowing it so fast that they start gagging and choking. So that's a great question. Those are a couple reasons why we do it. And folks, that is it. That is all the questions that we have for this evening that we have time to answer. Those are a lot of great questions. I'm sorry we didn't get to everybody's, but we will continue to do this. And I'm sure at some point in time, I'll run into you again and we'll do another one. Again, thanks everybody for watching. We appreciate all of y'all that subscribe and until next time, I'm the guy with the pink gun and you are Peter Armstrong. <laughs> <laughs> thanks guys.